Hey everybody, how you doing? It's Troy from Flying Squirrel. It's time to talk some astronomy again. This week we have a super blue cold blood moon and an 18,000 pound piece of metal getting ready to fall to Earth. Stick around. Okay, let's start with the uh, thing that's getting ready to crash to Earth. Um, the Chinese space station. First Chinese space station prototype, I should say. It's called Tiangong-1 literally translates to heavenly palace or sky palace. It's kind of appropriate. It also means temple. Um, it was launched in 2011. They did uh, autonomous docking testing with it. They had astronauts aboard on two, in 2012 through about the middle of 2013 on and off. Uh, it was a successful station. Um, they left it in 2013 uh, to re be replaced with Tiangong-2 which was then launched in 2016. Well, instead of deorbiting the station, they decided to leave it up to do some longevity experiments and to monitor the life of certain systems. They were also gonna use it as a backup in case Tiangong 2 didn't get uh, to where they needed it to be. Well, that worked fine, but in the interim, Tiangong 1 ran out of power. In early 2016, we noticed that it was starting to lose altitude, and uh, soon after that, the Chinese Space Agency admitted that, uh, yeah, they had lost contact with it. Well, it's been coming down ever since at an average of about six miles per month. In November of 2017, that rate increased because it's, in, it's encountering more and more atmospheric drag the lower it gets. Projection now is it's going to come crashing down to Earth sometime in mid-March, plus or minus a couple of weeks. It's not that big a deal. This has happened before. Um, in 1979, the U.S. Skylab came down. Uh, that's 10 times the size of Tiangong-1. Uh, and then in 2001, I believe, uh, Mir, uh, the Russian space station, came down. So, um, yeah, it's going to happen, uh, and it's going to happen soon. Uh, I was actually able to go watch Tiangong pass over my house last night, and if you want to see that, uh, try the links below. Heavens Above has a great satellite tracking app that'll tell you where and when you can see anything, uh, just about. But um, Tiangong 1 is one of the uh, special interests. So uh, it is coming down, and uh, anytime you see it, it might be the last. We don't know where, we don't know exactly when, but sometime in the next six weeks. With that out of the way, um, we have a super blue cold blood moon coming up. Super moon. That's a rare combination of ad adjectives, uh, but let's break it down. Super moon. Super moon. We talked about before, uh, that is just a coincidence that when the moon happens to be full at its closest approach, to Earth or the perigee. Uh, that's what makes a supermoon. We've got another one this month. Blue, kind of arbitrary. A blue moon happens once in a blue moon. Uh, it just means that we've got our second full moon this month. Uh, all this is going to happen, by the way, uh, on January 31st. If you remember, our previous supermoon full moon was January 1st, New Year's Day. So just barely made it in there. So that's super, that's blue. Cold moon the full moon this time of year is called the cold moon. Last month's was the wolf moon. This is the cold moon. Blood moon. Um, basically, that means we're going to have a full lunar eclipse. Uh, total, excuse me, total lunar eclipse along with this full moon. Here's the mystery. Uh, the moon goes around the Earth every month. Why the heck are eclipses so rare? And when they do happen, why do we typically have a lunar eclipse and a solar eclipse so close back to back? Which, by the way, we will. The lunar eclipse is on uh, January 31st. The solar eclipse will be roughly two weeks later, only visible in Antarctica and the very southern tip of South America, but it will happen. Why is that? Well, let me describe something here for you. The, the fact is, you know, we talked about the ecliptic, um, the plane that the solar system is in, and if you didn't remember that, you can go check here. The ecliptic, the moon is not in the ecliptic, uh, and this goes back to one of the mysteries of the origin of the moon. Uh, theory has it that the moon was formed when another early planet about the size of Mars smashed into Earth while both were being formed. Uh, the chunks that came out of that collision turned into the moon. Because of the energy of that collision, Earth got tilted. We're at 23 and a half degrees instead of straight up. and. The moon is actually at about a five degree tilt from the rest of the, uh, the average solar system plane. So let me show what that looks like. Let's pretend that you are the sun, okay? And this little ball is going to be the earth. So if the moon is rotating at a five degree tilt, 
Uh, this is going to be the orbital plane of the moon, right? At some points it's like this. At some points it's like this, right? So if you are the sun, um, you're not always going to see the moon lined up with the earth. At times, the moon is going to be back here, out of the shadow. It's too high for an eclipse. Same way when it's on your side. At times, it's going to be too low, right? And it'll pass right by and you'll not, it won't cast a shadow on Earth at all, so you won't get it. At those times, though, when the tilt just happens to line up so that the moon is crossing the ecliptic right uh, in line with the sun, as it is full or new, right? It's up here, down here, but it happens to come through. That's when you get an eclipse. You will get a, a solar eclipse on one side of that orbit, and then two weeks later, you'll get a lunar eclipse. That's why they come together. So because of that tilt and because of the change in the orientation of that tilt as we go around the sun, there is such thing as an eclipse season. We had a solar eclipse followed by a lunar eclipse back in August. Right now we have a lunar eclipse followed by a solar eclipse. Again, that's going to be in, our, in Antarctica on February 15th. We will have another season approximately six months out. We'll have a lunar eclipse in July and another solar eclipse in, uh, um, on August 11th of 2018. It'll be partial. The other thing you hear about eclipses all the time is penumbral, umbral, well, what the heck does that mean? Well, most of the time you see a diagram that looks kind of like this, um, where you know, you've know you got different radiance coming off of the sun, uh, and you've got partial shadow, full shadow, and all of that kind of stuff. Let me try to explain that in more relatable terms, though. You guys have probably all seen a penumbra. It's easily spotted if you're driving down a road with street lights, or if you're walking, but even better, if you're walking through a parking lot that has uh, many overhead lights, any spot on the ground is illuminated by multiple lights um, and you will see that your shadows, you have multiple shadows that kind of overlap. Same thing happens in an eclipse. Let me show you a little bit how that works. Okay, so the effect of a penumbra is essentially this. You gotta remember that the sun is a huge source of light. It is not a point source. And so it's very, very hard for the sun to cast a really crisp shadow unless you're really close to the surface where you're casting it standing on Earth. Because then, you know, then the sun is pretty small and it approximates a point. But if we're talking about things out in space, the sun's a pretty broad source. I've simulated it here using two lights that are shining pretty much in the same spot, and that simulates kind of a wide source of light like the sun. Well, here's what happens. I'm going to use my hand just so it's obvious. See that? There are multiple shadows here. This dim part here on the outside, that is where one light is shining and the other is not. Same over here, one light is shining and the other is not. Only in the middle where none of the lights can hit do you have full shadow. This half shadow is called the penumbra, the middle is called the umbra. Same thing happens with an eclipse. What will happen is the moon will actually pass into the penumbra first and it will just get dim. Then it'll cross into the umbra and you'll see the cookie cutter bite coming out of it. It'll go full through full shadow and turn blood red and then come out the same way. We'll see the cookie cut bite and then we'll see the dimness of the penumbra. Because it's a whole disc, you can't really see a sharp edge of the penumbra on the sun. It's just a gradual dimming until you get to the full shadow. So here's my best simulation of the effect with an actual sphere. Again, this is this is two lights, so you can see two full circles. But with the full disk of the sun, you'll see penumbra up here as well. It'll be more like a bullseye shape. But what we will see is that we will see partial eclipse. We'll see the, the penumbra start on the moon. Then we'll see the umbra start, and it'll become a partial eclipse. The moon will slowly turn dark. And when it's in full shadow, it'll turn red. And then the reverse happens on the other side. That's what they mean when they say penumbral eclipse and a full umbral eclipse. Umbral will cause partial or totality depending on where exactly it is. So why is a full lunar eclipse called a blood moon? Why does it turn red? If you've never seen a full lunar eclipse, at that moment of totality when the entire moon is covered by Earth's shadow, it actually turns a dark red-brown color. Uh, that's the blood moon. The reason it does that is actually kind of cool. 
if you were standing on the moon looking at Earth, what you would see is sunset all the way around the Earth. Um, just like when you're looking at a beautiful sunset here, the blue and green wavelengths get scattered out and what you see is the reds and oranges that penetrate and it makes the sky red and orange and just gorgeous. That same thing happens if you're on the moon looking at the earth. You see the red light coming around the edge of the earth through the atmosphere and being lensed and shining right at you on the moon. From our perspective, we see that red sunset all the way around lighting up the moon. Uh, that's the only light that can get through. So even though the moon's in total shadow, um, a little bit of that red sunset light gets through. And it's not an exaggeration to say the moon is being lit up by every sunset in the world all at once, which is pretty darn cool. Okay, so when will this happen? Uh, this is a West Coast event. I'm sorry. Uh, early morning of the 31st, next Wednesday, Everybody pretty much west of the Mississippi will be able to see total lunar eclipse and you'll see the blood moon very shortly before it sets. In fact, if you live right along the Mississippi River, uh, Paducah, Memphis, um, you've maybe got 10 minutes between the start of totality and moon set. Uh, in fact, totality might actually start as the moon is touching or even slightly below the horizon. So you get a half disk. West of the Mississippi, you will have totality while the moon is still in the morning sky. But for those of us on the East Coast, we'll only get to see a partial eclipse before the moon sets, and we won't get to see the blood moon at all. All right, so even though I've lit up this side that you, so that you can see it, let's picture um, this is actually the night side of the planet right here, okay? This is the night side. We're looking out in the night sky. The sun is behind me. As you can see here, the good old US of A and Canada and everything in North America is on the dark side, but it's gonna be rotating through. So what happens is the East Coast is going to disappear and rotate back onto the daylight side. Look, it's daytime for the USA and the, and the moon will set for the East Coast just as it passes into the shadow. And everybody else on the West Coast will see it low on the horizon, but sure enough, you'll see a full eclipsed moon. That's the geometry of what's going to happen. That's the way the cookie crumbles sometimes. And like I say, two weeks later, uh, we'll have a solar eclipse where the, uh, the moon will actually block the sun. If you happen to be in Antarctica or the southern tip of South America, you might be able to catch that. And so that'll be pretty cool. All right, guys, so that's it in a nutshell. A lunar eclipse can happen whenever the moon crosses the ecliptic, when it is full. Um, if it crosses at any other time, it's not going to be aligned with the sun. Um, and if it's full any other time, it might not be on the ecliptic because of that five degree tilt that the moon has uh, with respect to the, uh, to the plane of the solar system. That's why they're so rare. The Earth's shadow is a whole lot bigger uh, compared to the moon's shadow. So we do get lunar eclipses a whole lot more often than solar eclipses, but when they do happen, they tend to come together uh, two weeks apart. So next Wednesday, early morning, January 31st, get out there and you'll see the full blood moon. Again, it's the super, <laughs> super blue cold blood moon of January of 2018. So that's it. Uh, hope you learned something about eclipses. Hope you'd enjoyed this. And don't forget to duck and cover uh, in mid-March as Tian Gong comes down. Look for that. I'm sure it will be a, uh, an interesting re-entry to say the least when that happens. So uh, till next time, Troy from Flying Squirrel, thanks for tuning in. See ya. Bye.